buttons. No pointer. And the first examples will be on start oh, we're looking from starting from the short range up to the long distance wireless communications. So we've got two different topologies, point to point and point to multipoint. First, what about short range wireless communications? We said that some technologies are built for communication across centimeters, meters, and we said that last week. So remote controls. Uh, communication between portable devices, between cameras, phones, mobile uh, uh, headsets, earpieces and so on. Usually these technologies require low power requirements, low transmit power. A low transmit power means they don't, cannot transmit far over centimetres, metres but it means, importantly, that they do not consume much battery power because they're small devices uh, and we usually need them to be portable. We want to have a small battery requirement. So low transmit power, range of up to metres. In some cases, there's some high data rates, but in most cases, compared to the next technologies we'll look at, they are relatively low data rates, several megabits, some are built specifically for low data rate communications where you just want to communicate a small amount of information uh, and not so frequently, maybe every minute or so give updates. So things like ZigBee have been built for low data rate applications. Some of them use the common unlicensed 2.4 gigahertz frequency band that Wireless LAN also uses and there's some other frequency bands also used like infrared, ultra-wideband, uses a, a, a large range of frequencies. So we have short-range wireless communications, which we mentioned last week. Then across, in homes, in uh, buildings, across campuses, and in some special cases between buildings, we have wireless LANs. IEEE 802.11 is a, really a series of standards for different wireless LAN technologies. Wireless communications uh, between laptops, PCs, mobile phones, and usually to some central access point. Home office connectivity, range of meters to, to hundreds of meters, typically. Normally a point to point, a point to multi-point topology. That is, uh, we normally do not have directional antennas. My laptop does not have a directional antenna. I don't, need to, I don't need to position my laptop in a way such that it points to the access point outside. I can position it, position it anyway. The antenna's built into the, uh, the back of the, the display and I can position it anyway, it doesn't matter because it's an omnidirectional antenna, it transmits in all directions. So long as the access point is within range, it will be able to communicate. We're going to spend an entire topic on wireless LAN, so just briefly, there are different variations that have been developed over time, they've improved over time, uh, improved in technology as a result, improved in data rate. From 11 A and B, uh, well, there's originally simply 802.11, and then A and B were extensions, providing data rates of 11 and 54 megabits per second at maximum. Didn't mean you received this data rate, but that was the peak data rate. The most commonly used one was 802.11B, and it used a frequency band of 2.4 gigahertz again, the unlicensed frequency band. At the same time, 11A was available using a different frequency band. But for different reasons, it turned out 11B was most popular, even though it had a lower data rate. Uh, and an extension became 11G, which used the same frequency band as 11B, so that you could upgrade your networks gradually. That is, my laptop uses 11B, your laptop uses 11G, 
they can both communicate to the same access point. So it was cheaper to get new access points that would support the old 11B plus the new 11G devices. So that was an upgrade path. And nowadays we have 11N and there are in developments to improve upon that. So talking about speeds of up to hundreds of megabits per second. 11N uses 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency. We'll go into more depth of how they work in a later topic. Any questions on wireless LAN? You all use it. You know some characteristics. Last week you mentioned uh, the capabilities. We'll have a quiz sometime today, or if we don't have time today, tomorrow. So a quiz on all these network technologies. One thing, oh, we'll come up in the ne next slide. Okay, wireless LANs for homes, offices. What about over a, a larger area? Another uh, domain where wireless technologies are used, point-to-point -point links. So connecting, usually over a wide area network, connecting two sites together. Point-to-point, -point, so now we're using directional antennas. We take one antenna and point it at another antenna to create a wireless link. Range usually up to tens of kilometers, hundreds of meters up to tens of kilometers, depending upon the antenna sizes, the, the transmit power used uh, and the technologies used. Perhaps in the past, there wasn't a one common standard for using these point-to-point -point wireless links. There were some proprietary products. So one company would have their own technology, another company would have their technology, and they would not work together. So if I wanted to deploy a point-to-point -point link from this campus to the Rungsit campus, maybe five, ten years ago, I would need to go to a company, I would buy their equipment, and it would mean I could not buy the equipment of another company because they would not interoperate with each other. But now, variants and oh, uh, IEEE 802.16 has become a standard that is popular for point-to-point -point wireless links. And there have been some minor variations or, or uh, technologies which are very similar to this are used in some cases. So now that is a, a common technology being used and will be used in the future for point-to-point -point wireless links. WiMAX is a common name for it. For that. 802.11, what we use for wireless LANs, can also be used for point-to-point -point links. Although it was designed for uh, inside offices and so on, it can be, easy, well, it can be uh, used for a, a long-distance link if it's set up correctly. The purpose of these point-to-point wireless networks is to replace point-to-point -point wired links, especially wide area network links. We mentioned technologies called PDH and SDH. PDH, we use a copper wire in the ground, usually provided by a telecom company, and we lease that from them, pay per month to use that, and we get data rates of two, uh, up to maybe 34 megabits per second, depending upon the level that we choose. Well, instead of leasing that copper line, or if there's no copper link available between two locations, we can use a point-to-point -point wireless system. Put an antenna on, uh, on the buildings at both locations, point them at each other, and for example, using WiMAX, create a link between them. So as a replacement of wide area network links using wired technology. Typically, they are fixed devices. That is, we put the antenna on top of a building or on a tower, it's not moving. So it's not providing mobility, it's providing a uh, service for fixed communications or, or fixed locations. And use highly directional antennas. That is, we need to go to the top of the building, put the antenna and have it aligned correctly so that it points at the receiving antenna. If it's misaligned, then it will not transmit a signal in the right direction and the receiver will not receive a high power signal and will not be able to understand the communication. So 
So it requires some setup. Some WiMAX, as an example, can provide speeds up to, in theory, around 70 megabits per second, and there have been improvements to go even faster, or a range of 50 kilometers. So with WiMAX, you can actually choose the speed or a range. That is, if you want 70 megabits per second, you can use that, but n it won't be over 50 kilometers. It may be over 10 kilometers or so. If you want a distance of 50 kilometers, you won't get the full data rate. So we can use 802.11, the wireless LAN standards, for point-to-point -point links, especially at 11B. It uses an unlicensed frequency band, 2.4 gigahertz. We don't have to pay to use it. All right, data rate of 11 megabits per second, that's okay for some purposes. With good antennas and a good design, you can get ranges of 10 to 20 kilometers, maybe even further. Requires line of sight, LOS, line of sight communications. I don't know if we've mentioned that. An NLOS, non-line of sight. What that means is that, that the transmit and receive antennas need to be able to see each other. That is, there shouldn't be any large obstacles between them. So we have a fixed wireless link between our two campuses. So there's an antenna on top of this building and some building at Rungsit. And for them to communicate, I think they're using a technology which is, was slightly before WiMAX. So it's not WiMAX, but very similar. And to maintain that link between the two campuses, uh, they need a line of sight communications. If someone comes and builds a building, where are we, in Toshiba, and it's 10 stories high, and it now is between our two antennas, we may not be able to communicate between the two campuses. So you need to have no <coughs> obstacles between the transmitter and receiver to get a good connection. That's why you see people put the antennas on top of buildings or on top of other towers to get the height such that no other obstacle will be between the transmitter and receiver. If you get trees between transmitters and receivers, then the range can be reduced to some extent. Buildings, sometimes you just cannot get the signal through a building. But 802.11 is not really designed for this purpose, but it can be used for this purpose. It's cheap, the devices are cheap, the frequency band is free to use. 802.16 was designed for this special purpose. It allows higher data rates, uh, these, are, these are approximate values, and ranges of 10 to 20 kilometers. Again, we can uh, potentially increase the range with a lower data rate and vice versa. And uses a, f a licensed frequency band around 11 gigahertz. In fact, in 802.16 or WiMAX, there are several different variations and you can use different frequency bands. But the main one for line of sight communication, so fixed, the point to point links, is 11 gigahertz. There are also, you can use the WiMAX in a, a point to multipoint communication setup using a different frequency band. Also, some of these are licensed licensed spectrum, lower data rates, but can provide non-line of sight communication, similar to a <coughs> mobile phone setup. So you have a tower, some WiMAX antennas on it. Anyone within range of that tower can communicate to that antenna with their WiMAX enabled device. So considered similar to a, a mobile phone based mm -hmm. network for data services not for uh, uh, telephony services. So there are different variations of WiMAX available. Because it's licensed 
a license frequency band, it's expensive. That is, you need to pay for a license. Uh, so, same with mobile phone systems, you need to pay for a license. So, there's a high cost involved of setting up such a network. It's not something that you and I can do to connect our friends' homes. We could do that with 11B, but not with WiMAX. And the technology is uh, more complex than 11B. The transmitters and receivers are much more expensive. So some examples of point-to-point -point fixed wireless communications. What else have we got? Satellite. Okay, we can transmit between Earth stations and a satellite which basically repeats the signal and transmits down to an Earth station somewhere else on Earth to create effectively a point-to-point -point link. So instead of having a cable between the two sites, we can go via satellite, especially when we want to cover large distances and we, uh, or we cannot deploy the cables between the two the sites because it's because of the terrain, because of the, the country and different factors. And we can also use satellites in a point to multipoint topology. Have a transmitter on the ground, transmits a signal up to the satellite, the satellite transmits down in a broadcast mode. Anyone within the footprint of the satellite receives the signal and, and has the data. So satellite TV is an example of that. And satellite internet access, IP star, uh, uses, what is it, TICOM, a, a Thailand satellite to provide internet access to consumers across Asia and Oceania. So for internet access, TV, radio broadcasting, some cases of using a telephone in remote locations where you don't have mobile phones or fixed landline. Any questions? We're going through this reasonably quick because some of it, we've mentioned satellite technologies in ITS 323 and it's not too complex. Uh, just give some examples of the different wireless technologies we can have available. What's the problem with using satellite internet? What's the problem with using normal internet services over a satellite link? The weather, okay, the weather may interrupt the, may, may impact upon the signal. Anything else? What do you think a problem is if you need to access Facebook or play an online game when you're using IP star as an internet, satellite internet provider? Delay. Satellites. <coughs> the satellites normally used for internet access are geostationary or in a geostationary orbit. They are a long way away from Earth. 36,000 kilometers is the orbit ab above Earth, so or uh, away from Earth. So that results in a propagation delay of around 120 milliseconds to get to the satellite to transmit up and another 120 milliseconds down. So one quarter of a millisecond to send your packet from the Earth station to here. So that delay contributes a lot to the end-to-end -end delay. So plus other delays inside the network. And when you send a request for a web page and then receive the response, then that can add up to seconds eventually. So the delay is a, a major limitation for some applications. And you just cannot avoid that. The, the distance, the propagation delay cannot be overcome. Last example, who has a mobile phone? Everyone. So mobile telephony is an example of a wireless network technology. Mobile phones, cell phones, whichever you, you prefer to call them, and the network that is used to not just provide now uh, telephone calls, but data access as well. 
and that's what we'll concentrate on. Typically have range of kilometres from a particular base station, range of kilometres, but of course there may be multiple base stations or, or transmitters giving us much larger coverage than just kilometres. We'll talk about some different technologies that are used in mobile telephone networks. Uh, and I'll give some examples which you don't have in these slides, but are easily found on the website and online. We're just going to select some te technologies we'll talk about, maybe the most common ones. There are others as well. And we're going to focus on the, the data communications. That is, internet access, for example, via mobile phone, not so much about talking. And we'll talk about the difference. Mobile phone technologies have evolved over time, and the evolutions have been marketed uh, and even the technologies as different generations. So first generation, second generation, 3G, third generation, 4G, and, and the future. First generation is really the old style analog mobile phones. And if anyone had seen them, they originally they were almost the size of a laptop, or bigger than laptops. So analog mobile phones, which people would carry around in some case in a suitcase. So that was the original first generation. Second generation, they moved from analog transmissions to digital transmissions, so digital mobile phones. And there were two main variations in different parts of the world. One was based on, or well one was GSM, the Global System for Mobile Communications, mobile uh, telephony. And one was uh, marketed as CDMA1. So two different technologies in the second generation. GSM really came out of Europe and CDMA1 in North America. And they uh, were used in different parts of the world. They weren't interoperable. That is, you couldn't take your GSM phone to North America and use the telephone network there. You could take it from Australia to Thailand to Europe and roam between the networks if they were using GSM within the networks in those countries. Those two second generation technologies, GSM and CDMA1, have evolved over time. They've been improved. And from the perspective of data communications, not using it for a phone call, but using it for internet access, some of the technologies that have been evolved in the GSM networks, we had what was called circuit switch data. So uh, very slow, well, 14 kilobits per second data internet access was the original one using GSM. And then upgraded to a packet switching uh, data access, GPRS, which provide data rates of tens of kilobits per second up to, I think, uh, well, on a later slide, I've got the maximum, up to close to 100 kilobits per second. And edge was an improvement of that. And the next major improvement led, so sometimes if we consider this 2G, second generation, these e evolutions led to improvements and people marketed them as 2.5G, 2.5G, that is our improvements, or 2.9G. Third generation, 3G, was a technology called UMTS. It was it derived from the original GSM type network? And that's been improved over time. The technology for 3G has been around for many years. Improved uh, to things like HSPA, LTE, and some others which we'll go through in subsequent slides. <coughs> from our perspective, they have improved the data rate available to the end user from 14 kilobits per second up to 10, 20, 40 megabits per second. So a significant increase in the data rate for data access. Similar evolution applied on the, the North American CDMA1 mobile phone technology. 
and it had something called 1X RTT, EV data only, and UMB. We'll focus on the GSM derived technologies. You know what applications can be used on mobile phones, you probably use them every day. Of course, mobile phones were built for <coughs> voice calls, but they've progressively been improved to support data access. Let's look at the basics of a mobile phone telephone network and to explain some of the, the differences between the technologies. A very simple view of a, a telephone network. We have a, a mobile phone, the end user device. We have a set of base stations. And they are the points where the mobile phone communicates with wirelessly. That's the wireless link in the mobile phone network, from the mobile phone to a base station. So there's an antenna or a set of antennas on some tower, and you communicate wirelessly from your phone to that base station. And base stations may have coverage of, in, in high density areas in cities, maybe tens of hundreds of metres, to in uh, more open areas, uh, several kilometres, kilometres in, in range. So you need to be within range of the base station to create a wireless link to it. And to provide coverage across a large area, you have multiple base stations. So the, the mobile telephone company that offers the service and provides the network will deploy a set of base stations across a large area, across a city or a country, for example. And there are ways to design and, and deploy those base stations in it such that you get optimal coverage in different areas. Those base stations are normally connected via wired links back to the network operator's core network. That is, the company that operates the mobile phone service has their own network that connects these base stations together. When you make a telephone call, it goes via the wireless link to the base station through the wired links, through the operator's core network, and it should, if you're calling someone on a fixed telephone line, it will go out to the public switch telephone network, the PSTN, and then out to the destination on the other side of the world, if, you, if that's the destination, a call in. So there's some gateway that the network operator manages that connects to some public telephone network. Uh, who's your mobile phone operator of choice? Uh, True. True. So let's say True has some base station and we have our mobile phone and True's network, uh, I'll draw it a bit better. So the same as here. True will have some gateway that connects to a, a public switch telephone network provider in Thailand, say uh, TOT, which then has a network either across, across the country, but also has links to other telephone operators in other countries, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and elsewhere. So this is from the telephone side of the network when you make a phone call. But we want to focus on the data access. Okay, what happens when you want to access websites via your mobile phone? Then with the current setup of mobile phone networks, there's a separate gateway that goes to the internet. And in fact, in some cases, separate parts of the Trues, this is their core network, 
may handle the data that's going out to the internet. That is, when you access websites via your mobile phone, it goes to the base station over the operator's core network and then to a gateway which connects to some other internet service provider which then is out onto the, the general internet. The phone calls use circuit switching. And the data access uses packet switching. So when you make a phone call, you, if your phone through the operator's network sets up a circuit all the way to the destination. The same with a normal landline telephone. Set up a circuit and then when you talk, it's sent across that circuit to the destination. When you access a website, your phone sends packets to the base station through the core network and out onto the internet and come back as packets. So using a different uh, approach for communication for voice and data access. In fact, the earlier data access didn't use, there was no packet network, packet switching network. There was only the circuit switching network in the earliest versions. So CSD, circuit switch data, was, gave you data access, but it used the circuit switch connection. It was like a dial-up connection. Remember last week when we explained the very basics of dial-up, dial-up internet access, your modem at home makes a telephone call to an ISP's modem that creates a connection and then they connect out to the internet. That's what the earlier uh, data, data access mechanisms used for GSM. Circuit switch data provided 14 kilobits per second. But using circuit switching for data delivery is very inefficient. So they've, the network's been improved, GPRS, generalized pa packet radio service allows packet switching for the data component. Circuit switching still for the voice calls. And all of them from now on use packet switching for the data component. So that's the typical configuration of a, or a simplified configuration of a telephone operator's network. The wireless part is just from the phone to the base station. The rest is normally wired or any other technology we've gone through. We could have point-to-point -point wireless links here. A common technology used inside the core network is in fact ATM, asynchronous transfer mode. Between base stations and different devices in the core network. Uh, I've got an example with slightly more detail of this diagram. This shows the similar network but in a bit more depth and, and identifies some of the components. Uh, so this is for a 3G network but the same uh, concept. We have the mobile, mobile device, the user element, or user equipment, UE here. The, the base stations, these towers here, these two are examples of base stations referred to in 3G networks, node B devices. So these are the this is the terminology used in some of the standards. Node Bs or base stations. They connect back to some radio network controller. So this is the equipment operated by the, the telephone network operator. And then they connect, or the, the radio network controller connects to the packet switch core network or the circuit switch core network for voice calls and for data access. There's some mobile switching center, which, ha which is a, a, a large telephone switch, which handles directing the calls, uh, and a gateway 
mobile switching centre that connects out to the public telephone network. And inside the packet switch core network for the data access, there are similar devices for controlling really routers for controlling the traffic going through, gateway switching nodes. And out the PDN really, from our perspective here, is the internet. Uh, the one thing that we haven't shown, there are some databases that keep track of the users. So you're using True, then you are a home user of True's network. They would have a register of you in their database, the home location register, whether you're on their network. If you roam to other networks, then you may be recorded, although it's not shown here, there's another database called the Visitor Location Register. Anyone use DTAC? Maybe the last few weeks uh, they've had some outages because they've been upgrading some of these components. I think the, uh, uh, earlier this month in the south of Thailand, their mobile, mobile switching centre uh, had some problems and hence people couldn't make calls. <coughs> so they've been upgrading the mobile switching centre and had problems with the home location and the visitor location register. These are databases, authentication center. When you make a call or access some service, you need to be authenticated to make sure that you're, you've paid your money to access this service. So a little bit more detail of the structure of a telephone network, a mobile phone network, separating the circuit switch network for voice calls and the packet switch network for data access. This is for 3G, but it's very similar for uh, earlier technology. Let's go back to our lecture notes. What's next? This gives some of the data rates for the technologies that have been derived from GSM networks. Starting from circuit switch data, which in fact use circuit switching, maximum data rate of 14 kilobits per second. So uh, not very useful for today's applications. Upgraded to a packet switching techno technology, GPRS, which was then enhanced to edge and talking about data rates, download data rates of hundreds of kilobits per second, upload of 40 or 120 kilobits per second. This shows download, upload rate. So there may be differences between upload and download. GPRS and EDGE were extensions of GSM networks. So still most telephones uh, or most networks support GSM. That's considered a second generation technology. They were really soft, we can think of software upgrades to GSM networks. That is, in terms of changing the network structure, not much had to be done for the operator to upgrade from GPRS to EDGE. It wasn't a large upgrade of the network and therefore wasn't expensive compared to other approaches. Moving from second generation to third generation, which is moving from the, these GSM-based GPRS and EDGE to the third generation, which is an example is UMTS, <coughs> requires a significant upgrade in the equipment in the network. The base stations, those different devices that we showed in the previous diagram, the mobile switching center and so on, need new technologies. So that's why, one of the reasons why operators upgrading from the old telephone 2G to 3G is a large step. It's expensive to do. UMTS officially provides a download speed of 384 kilobits per second. But again, there have been extens extensions of that to make it faster for data access. Some of the extensions are under the High Speed Packet Access, HSPA name. There was an extension to up to increase the speed for the downlink, HSDPA, up to 14 megabits per second, and increase the uplink up to 5.7 megabits per second, 
and HSPA plus, downlink 42 megabits per second, uplink 22 megabits per second. And there are improvements further than that. There's some, one up to 80 megabits per second. And a further enhancement, long-term evolution, LTE, providing and requiring usually a significant upgrade to the network. Once you have a 3G network in place, moving from here to HSDPA, HSUPA, HSPA is not a significant upgrade. It's more of a software upgrade on most of the devices. But moving from UMTS and these to LTE requires, again, some significant hardware upgrades in the network. So it's costly for the operator and will take time. But possible to reach download speeds of several hundred megabits per second, in theory, and uploads of tens of megabits per second. I've got similar information on a different slide, which you don't have. Let's have a look. Uh, what's this one? This summarizes some of the different technologies. Uh, we've spoke about, we mentioned just before Edge, which is a, a data service for GSM and UMTS, which is the 3G, uh, or a common 3G uh, technology, third generation, and its extensions, HSPA and LTE. This table also lists some other technologies. CDMA 2000 was deployed as a, uh, a third generation technology in the Americas, North and South America, whereas Edge was an extension of GSM, which was much more widespread, most of Asia, Europe, uh, Africa, and so on. DECT is something that's been used mainly for cordless phones, uh, so we won't worry so much about that. And WiMAX comes in here as well. We said before, WiMAX can be used as a service in a point-to-multipoint configuration, where you have a tower, mobile devices access that tower. The same configuration as here. Not for mobile phone calls, but for data access. So it's an alternative technology. This just lists some of the uh, technologies that are used. Uh, time division multiple access, code division multiple access, and so on. That's not a focus for us right now. And sh showing some of the more recent data, uh, mobile data, technologies. Edge from the GSM technologies, download of 1.6 megabits, upload of 500 kilobits per second. UMTS, talking about up to 14 megabits per, megabits per second download, but with high speed packet access, 42 megabits, even 84 megabit, megabits per second download. Long term evolution, up to several hundred, 300 megabits per second download. YX, talking about tens of megabits per second. So just a different comparison between those, the speeds between the different mobile data technologies. Who has 3G access on their mobile phone? <laughs> All right. Who, who has a mobile phone that technically supports 3G? Maybe you don't use it, you don't pay for it, but who has a mobile phone that supports 3G? All right, let's start simpler. Who has a mobile phone? <laughs> and you'll fail if you get these questions wrong. Who has a mobile phone? Put your hand up. A mobile phone. He's got one in his hand. Put, put your hand up. Okay, if you leave your hands up, if, if you have 3G capabilities on your phone, leave your hand up. So probably more than half. So many phones today have the capabilities. 
Uh, anyone? That's not a 3G phone. <laughs> I'll better turn that off. Who, who has used 3G access on their mobile phone? Okay, some people. Do you know the download speeds that you achieve? Or have you, can you compare the download speeds to, uh, is it fast? Does it change? That is, some places it may be fast, some places it's almost unbearable to use. So it changes based upon uh, the link connection, the distance you are from the base station, the number of users in the area, that is the demand for the network. Um, most likely you're using the basic UMTS, which provides download speeds of 384 kilobits per second, or possibly in some network operators have some of the improvements providing I think one is seven megabits per second down, and in some cases, 14 megabits per second down. So that's the current uh, technologies more common in 3G networks in Thailand. In many countries, HSPA is supported. 42 megabits per second is common down. And LTE is being deployed in some cases in some select operator networks. We have one more. An important thing with mobile telephone networks and especially 3G networks is what frequency band is used. There are, for UMTS, there are five different official bands or five main frequency bands. The most commonly used frequency band is the 2,100 megahertz, 2.1 gigahertz. That's used by the majority of the network operators throughout the world, except for some regions. In the US and some South American countries, this frequency band is already used by something else, by satellites and other services. So in some regions, the 2.1 gigahertz cannot be used, so they use either 1900 or 1700 megahertz. But this is the most common, co most common frequency band used, uh, and most 3G enabled phones will support this frequency band. Most, if not all. Two other frequency bands which are used in some countries, or in, in fact many countries, are the 850 megahertz and 900 megahertz. These have the advantage in that they provide larger coverage. The lower frequencies we can transmit over larger distances, so therefore often used to provide well, in areas where we need large coverage, in regional or rural areas, outside of cities, in large countries. The 850 and 900 megahertz bands are used in those areas. So in, in a number of countries, in the cities they will use the 2.1 gigahertz and possibly also have a network covering outside of cities using the 850 or 900 megahertz. Does anyone know what frequency their 3G phone supports? Uh, my phone supports uh, <laughs> In Thailand at least it becomes a little bit difficult or confusing because different operators use different different frequency, frequencies. So there's AIS, True, DTAC, so some use 900 megahertz, some use 850 megahertz. So if you get a phone that only supports 850 megahertz, not 900, you can only use on that operator's network. Most phones support 20, 2100 plus one of these. Some phones support both of these, but the phones that support just one of them can only work on the specific operator's network. And that's why there's an issue with, well, that's one of the 
problems with the current 3G in Thailand and the need to upgrade the licenses so that the operators can use the 21, 2100 megahertz, the more common frequency band. All phones support that. So frequency band is important because it impacts on coverage and uh, the, how wide spread it is in the, the user equipment in the phones. Oh, we've got one more slide, sorry. One more in this extra set. I'll put these on the website so you can download these. I hope I've got one more. What about the future? Just briefly, fourth generation. Although in some countries you may see 4G marketed as a mobile phone service, in fact, usually they're just considered 3.5G 3, 3 or 3.9G. Fourth generation mobile phone services have been standardized by ITU called IMT Advance, but the basic requirements are that a 4G service will provide 100 megabits per second download for high mobility users. High mobility means in a car or in a train. One gigabit per second download for pedestrians for, <coughs> for normal mobile users. So to a technology to be called fourth generation from ITU's perspective, it must meet these requirements. Importantly, 4G networks will use all IP-based network. In our 3G and 2G networks, we separate the circuit switching and packet switching they use IP in some parts of the network, the internet protocol, but not necessarily all parts. In 4G networks, you can think this is all combined into one. All of these devices are just IP routers. It just becomes another IP network here. So it simplifies the network in here, and they use the internet protocol for all access. Even for your voice calls, you basically use voice over IP when you use a voice call via 4G technology. So we will talk about voice over IP and mobile IP in later topics. Two technologies which are in development still, LTE, Long Term Evolution Advanced, and Wireless MAN Advanced, which is really an extension of WiMAX and an extension of the, the current 3G technologies, LTE. Let's summarize, because we've almost finished this topic. Summary of wireless networks. We can use wireless technologies in both the access networks, where the end users connect to, and inside the core networks. Wireless LAN, Bluetooth, mobile phones, WiMAX, satellite, access networks. WiMAX, satellite, even wireless LAN can be used in a core network. Compared to wired technologies, wireless technologies typically offer a lower data rate at the same cost. It's not, a, it's not a direct comparison, but if you can think roughly, inside your home or office, wired, you've got Ethernet, 100, one gigabit, 100 megabits, 1,000 megabits per second data rates. Typical wireless LAN, 54 megabits per second, maybe 100, 300 megabits per second. So about less than half the data rate for the same level of technology, or the same generation. Another comparison may be, okay, use ADSL for home internet, or if you can't use ADSL, use your mobile phone. ADSL, the original version, 1.5 megabits per second, edge in the past 200 kilobits per second, much faster with wired technologies. Or Nowadays, you can use HSPA, the 3G technologies. Talking about tens of megabits per second. But nowadays, in your home in some areas, you can get optical access, or up to 100 megabits per second. Or WiMAX, 
compared to optical maybe one gigabit per second. <coughs> so in most cases, for the same cost, the wired technologies provide a higher data rate. But the wireless technologies provide the convenience and the mobility. And that finishes for our coverage of network technologies. Ready for a quiz? Not yet. Not yet. We still have. A few more slides on the next topic. Where are we? Next topic is uh, coverage and review of the internet, followed by some new things about the internet. Yep. What again? Why LTEs won't connect to the? I mean, you can't connect the physical hub there. So why? Why does it create more? Why? Uh, why does? Why do you say? Why does a mobile phone or? create LTE-based mobile phone, create noise. Why does the LTE phone create noise, con connect making a call to a house? I don't know. That, I, I don't think there would be any reason in, in the standard or in the technology that would cause that. Um, I, I, I can't think of any reason why that would be, I can imagine there may be some problems. LTE has only been around, there's not many devices that support it yet. Maybe the implementations are not so good, but I cannot think of why uh, there'd be some incompatibility between an LTE mobile phone and a landline home phone. Have you heard about it? Uh, the, I mean, LTE uses the same structure that is, here's your mobile phone, it connects here. Once it goes out here to the, to the landline telephone, the landline telephone doesn't even know it's a mobile phone calling. It's just another connection to the phone. So in theory, it should work perfectly. In practice, there may be some problems with implementation. Maybe. And it may be problems with the network operator as well. Is that a question? <laughs> any questions? No? Any questions? Are any other questions on wireless networks? Security of data on mobile network. Security of data on a mobile network. First, let's look at the network. Although we're not touching security, we can make some basic analysis. This link in our mobile network is wireless. Here from the base station out to these gateways, whichever way we go, let's say that's owned and operated by the network operator, AIS or True or whoever. Let's say we trust them, that is you trust the, the people who work there, then they're using wired networks. The security of your data inside here should be no different than any other network. Okay? It's as secure as any other network or as insecure as any other network. The wireless link, as with any wireless link, has the problem that people can intercept. Are there any restrictions? Yes, so since people can intercept easily, they apply encryption, uh, that, or they can apply encryption of the call if needed. Uh, so would it be the same as the LTE? They. Uh, 
not just encryption, but the other thing is authentication to make sure that the person making the call is who they say they are. It's not me pretending to be a subscriber of AIS using their network but paying them no money. So the security of encryption and authentication, uh, the SIM card plays a role in providing some authentication or identification information. Um, there have been reports or there are ways that people have uh, created a fake identity. So you program a special SIM card so that you pretend to be someone else. But in practice, it's quite hard to, to break the security. In th it's possible, but very hard, because to do so, you need expensive equipment. Compared to, say, wireless LAN, in wireless LAN, if we get a chance, you will see that it's very easy to break the security of wireless LAN networks. We can, I can listen in to everything that you send across the SIT wireless network. But with mobile phone networks, it's relatively secure compared to other wireless networks. Any other questions? Everything OK? Good. Let's look at how the internet works. But you know, you know the basics of how the internet works. So in fact, the first set of slides we're going to skip over. They're more for reference. So things you know. Sorry. The aim of this set of slides, but we won't go through them all, review the concepts of you and the technologies <coughs> used in the internet. And the th real thing that we're going to focus on in this lecture is look at the real structure of the internet today. A simplified view. Internet working and internet, the internet protocol, we're going to skip over very quickly. A simple view of an, I of an internet, we have our access networks that end users connect to. We have many of them. They connect together via core networks. And the things that connect the individual networks together are routers in our internet. So this is stuff we already know. The internet protocol, IP, again, you've covered this in ITS323, and we're not going to repeat it again. I assume you know it all. But we don't need to remember too much about it to understand how it works. That we have routers that use datagram packet switching. It's a connection-less protocol. And we basically, from a source, create an IP datagram, send to a router, send to the router, router until it gets to the destination. IP addresses. I don't think you need to remember the exact structure, but you know the basics of IP addresses for this course. So let's skip through quickly. Because I think you'll study this in your own time if you can't remember. Sometimes we'll refer to the IP datagram. So here you can look back. If you can't remember the structure of it, we know it's here. Uh, IP addresses. IP addresses, we have address mask or subnet mask. And the address has two parts. One part identifies the network. One part identifies the host. And there are some special cases. OK, that's coverage of the internet protocol. What we want to focus on is how how is the internet structured today? And by doing this, we'll introduce some new concepts uh, that you haven't seen in, in previous courses. We'll need to introduce what is an autonomous system, AS. If we draw a simple, <coughs> simple internet, oops. 
where we draw the component networks as clouds connected via routers. No need to draw this, I don't think. And we have, may have many other networks and so the networks connected via routers and the hosts attached to the networks, the subnets. With routing, what we do is we store routing tables on the routers and on the hosts so that when this host has a packet to send, it looks at the destination address, looks up the routing table, and the routing table tells it, okay, to reach destination D, the routing table should sell, tell this host to send the packet to router 1. When router 1 receives the packet, if everything's working correctly, the routing table will tell that router to send that packet, say, to router 3, R3. And that will use the routing table to deliver to R4, eventually to the destination. Those routing tables, the data in them is created or is populated using routing protocols. A routing protocol, we distribute information about the network so that we can calculate the least cost paths through the network. We would like to send our packets across the least cost paths from source to destination. A routing protocol distributes information between the routers such that they can calculate those least cost paths. Once they calculate the least cost paths, they store the data in the routing tables. That's how it works, and that's what we've covered in, in a previous course. So in this internet, one way to do that is that, for example, this router would send packets to all other routers Or the, uh, the six other routers saying this is the information about the neighbours I'm connected to and as would R2 it would send information to all other routers about who it's connected to and from all that information that's distributed they would calculate the least cost paths. The problem with this approach when we extend this example from six or seven networks up to the internet which has hundreds of thousands of networks if my router wants to send a packet to every other router in the world, it will create too much overhead. It will, be, uh, uh, it will not be practical to implement this distribution of information throughout everyone in the world. It's not practical to have all routers in the internet participate in the routing protocols. Because A, there'll be too much overhead, B, it would take too much time to learn about the, the uh, structure and see it will take too long to calculate the least cost paths. So to avoid this in the internet where we have hundreds of thousands of networks we divide that into groups. The routers are divided into groups based on the owner of a network. A group of networks and routers that are controlled by a single administrative authority is an autonomous system, AS. For example, an internet service provider, you pay TOT to get internet access, they're an internet service provider, they could be considered to having a single autonomous system, that entire company. Because that company owns a set of networks, not just one subnet, but a set of subnets across Thailand, a set of routers, and they manage all their own routers and networks, so they are a single administrative authority. Their network of subnets and routers would be, or could be, for example, a single autonomous system. Another internet service provider would run an, another autonomous system. So in fact, the internet is made up of autonomous systems connected together. Autonomous systems are made up of 
subnets and routers, or subnets connected together via routers. So, although our network is not so big here, it could be this is one autonomous system. Uh, This is another autonomous system. This is a small one. And this is another autonomous system. Four. So our entire internet, we can think of it as a set of autonomous systems. The autonomous systems are connected together via routers. But they're special purpose routers. Uh, we'll see they have a special name. So this autonomous system connects to this one. So this may be one internet service provider. This another. They connect together via some device, a router. Within a, an autonomous system, we may have multiple IP subnets connected together via routers. And of course, may have hosts attached to some of those IP subnets. So this is something new, the uh, concept of an autonomous system. Each autonomous system has a number assigned to it, a unique number assigned by the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, IANA. So the same organization that uh, effectively manages IP addresses also allocates autonomous system numbers, ASNs, to organizations. some examples, and these examples, I won't bring it up now, but I've shown you before the, the map of the internet. Uh, there's a website within Thailand. It shows different ISPs connected together. And on, for each ISP, it shows the autonomous system number. So this is taken from some time ago. True Internet, that's an organization providing, uh, as an internet service provider, AS7470. So that's one autonomous system. And each ISP has its own unique uh, AS number. Some companies may have multiple autonom autonomous systems. If, for example, they have a, a gateway and, and a, uh, a national level ISP. Again, this is several years old now, but it's updated on, or it's, it's newer on the website. Uh, so at this Three years ago, uh, the number of autonomous system numbers in Thailand was about 200, probably larger now. So 200 organizations which own and operate an autonomous system in, inside Thailand. And each autonomous system may be multiple different subnets with different subnet ranges or, or address masks. And of course, the same in other countries. So, within an autonomous system, the routing is managed by the organization that runs that autonomous system. That is, one company owns this network. They provide routing inside this autonomous system. That is, these, well, router four and router seven, there's only two here, exchange information with each other about their connectivity so that they can determine the least cost paths inside this network. This example is not so good because it's quite small. The least cost paths are very simple. But in a larger real network where we may have tens of, even hundreds of routers, internal to the autonomous system, we have routing. Routers exchange information create their routing tables such that we'll have least cost paths through the network. The routing performed inside is performed using, in general, an interior gateway protocol, an IGP. <coughs> gateway means the same as router in the terminology we use here. Where you see gateway, you can think router. This is a gateway or it's a router. 
at least in this, this uh, domain. There are different IGPs available. There are different routing protocols for internal for an aut autonomous system. Some of them RIP, OSPF. If you're studying Dr. Comwood's course now, you may see some of these in more detail, these routing protocols. They are used by a single organisation inside their network. It's up to the owner of the network to choose the protocol they want that best suits their requirements. This network may use OS... When I say this network, this autonomous system may use OSPF inside these two networks, and this one may use something else. They don't need to interoperate because the routing inside here stays within here, the routing protocol, that is. It doesn't communicate with any of the routers outside here or in any other autonomous system. So we use the routing protocol to find the least cost pass within this autonomous system, as does every other AS. Then, between the autonomous systems, they use a different routing protocol to exchange information from here to here an exterior gateway protocol. Interior within, exterior between the autonomous systems. And there's only one exterior gateway protocol in use today. It's the border gateway protocol, BGP, although there's some different versions. So between autonomous systems, to exchange information, they use BGP, the border gateway protocol. Essentially what happens is that they exchange information about what's inside this network to this autonomous system. So AS1 uses BGP to tell AS2 inside here we have uh, subnet 64.3.2.0 and 72.16.0.0. Here are two IP subnets. AS1 would use BGP to tell AS2 that these two subnets exist inside here. Similar, AS2 would use BGP to tell AS1 that the subnets here that these two subnets exist in here. And AS2 would use BGP to tell AS1 what other AS, what other autonomous systems are reachable via AS2. So we can think that AS1 now knows what is reachable directly via AS2 and what, is, what other autonomous systems can be reached via AS2. AS1 will know to reach AS3 it can send via AS2. And similar to reach autonomous system 4, we can send via AS2. So they, the two autonomous systems exchange information about what's in their networks and what other networks they can reach. The border gateway protocol between autonomous systems, inside autonomous systems, one of several routing protocols can be used. OSPF, EIGRP and others. We won't go through how those routing protocols work in any detail. Just make sure you can distinguish between an interior and exterior gateway protocol and in particular that BGP is an exterior gateway protocol. It is the exterior gateway protocol used in the internet. I think this is just another example similar to what we drew on the board where okay, we have the internet made up of autonomous systems connected together via these routers and we can refer to these routers as exterior routers or border routers. They are routers connecting or connected at the border of different autonomous systems. 
within each autonomous system we have different subnets of, or different IP networks, all connected together via interior routers. Managed by one organisation is the routing inside. BGP is used for routing or exchanging information between autonomous <coughs> systems. How do we, so now if we look from the perspective of an autonomous system, and for simplicity for now, let's say an internet service provider has its own autonomous system. That is, TOT is an internet service provider in Thailand, True is another internet service provider. Let's say they have their both, they both have their own networks, their own autonomous systems, and as do other internet service providers. How do those internet service providers connect with each other, both from a technical perspective and what arrangements do they have such that they will transfer each other's traffic? Two autonomous systems that connect together are known as peers. So these two are peers. They connect directly with each other. AS1 and AS4 are not peers. They don't have a direct connection. So we, we have a physical direction between these. They have a, a shared router or they have a link between they have a shared link between devices in each of the organisation's networks. To connect between peers, we need some physical, physical connection, some cable, some device. And in practice, that physical connection can be direct between two peers. My company and your company have an agreement. We find, uh, we Create a uh, we pay for a cable to link the devices in each of our networks. A direct connection. Private peering, that's referred to. Alternatively, there are some companies that provide a service where many peers connect into. Public peering. Public peering via an internet exchange point. So let's say Somewhere in Bangkok, there's a public internet exchange point. Bangkok internet exchange point, IXP. Which is really a small network or a, a, a network of switches. So some building with a network inside and different ISPs or different organisations have links into this exchange point. And so in some cases many different organisations, hundreds. So they connect via their physical links into the exchange point and now potentially ISP1 can peer with any of the other ISPs that connect to this exchange point. So there are companies that provide this service. There's a London IXP, there's an Amsterdam one, they're big ones in, in major cities across the world. The alternative, the, so that's public peering, the private peering is when two ISPs create a physical connection between, direct between them. That's the physical connection. But of course, when we peer two networks together, all of the data that comes from the customers of ISP1 needs, may have to traverse the, cust uh, the, the network of ISP2. We need some agreements about whose traffic is going to flow through the network and in fact how much you're going to pay for that. So there's some commercial contracts that are established between the companies that peer with each other to agree upon the policies of how much things cost, what technical measures they're using, what protocols they use and so on. So that's another part that uh, peers need in order to connect, some peering agreement. We can classify the types of agreements into two different categories, either transit agreements or peering agreements. 
Now the terminology gets a bit confusing here. We've said from the physical connection we can have private peering. Two autonomous systems connect directly together or we can have public peering. Multiple autonomous systems or ISPs connect via a shared exchange point. From the agreement perspective we can have a transit agreement or a peering agreement. In a transit agreement one organisation agrees to pay the other organisation for traffic to pass through their network. In a peering agreement we can think that the two organisations make an agreement such that I will carry your traffic for free if you carry my traffic for free. So two, two basic types of agreements there. <coughs> Assuming the autonomous, autonomous systems are internet service providers, we can classify based on, upon the agreements they use different tiers or different levels of internet service providers. Top, the top level or tier one, tier two and tier three are uh, the, the common classification. Let's illustrate this. Here's our internet. We have 15 autonomous systems. Or well, I think we have 15 different internet service providers across the internet, across the, the world. There's some hierarchy between the autonomous systems. At the bottom level, each autonomous system at the bottom level has some IP networks. Like we showed here, this autonomous system has two IP networks inside. That's what this part shows. Here's AS9 has two networks inside it. Network C and network D. And the others have networks as well. This autonomous system, and we have customers connected to these networks. Let's say you and I subscribe to this internet service provider. We may connect via network A. Someone else subscribes to this internet service provider. They connect via network C. So I pay per month to use their network. This internet service provider, all of my traffic and their other customers goes via their network and then needs to go out onto the wider internet. <coughs> and where does it go depends upon where they have peer peering connections to. In this case, AS8 has a peering connection, uh, has a connection to AS6. And what we're trying to illustrate in this diagram is that between between ISPs on one level and the higher level there's a transit agreement in place. AS8 pays AS6 to carry their traffic. Everything that I send via network A goes through AS8 and eventually needs to go, if it needs to go to the destination at network C. To reach here it needs to go through AS6 so for every packet I send, this organisation will need to pay this organisation for that traffic because they have a transit agreement. They pay for the traffic to transit their network. And as we move up the tiers, we also have transit agreements. This internet service provider would pay this internet service provider for my traffic to go through their network and then it would come down to the destination. Between entities at the uh, autonomous systems at the same tier and above we have transit agreements where they pay for the traffic to be cr carried. Between autonomous systems at the same level we have peering agreements normally and in particular at the top level Think of this as our small local ISP in Thailand. 
They have 10,000 customers, small company. The customers connect there. For them, this ISP to connect to everyone else in Thailand, they pay a national ISP, TOT for example. <coughs> TOT has coverage across the country. This small internet service provider only has coverage in Bangkok. I connect to this small ISP. I pay them for internet access. This small ISP pays TOT for their traffic to be carried via TOT's network. So we could say TOT or this second level is a tier two ISP. What if we want to get our traffic outside of the country, across the world? Then we have really global level ISPs at tier one that have connections throughout the globe, across the world. So the tier one ISPs have connections across the world and all of, by definition, all of the tier one ISPs have a peering agreement with each other. And currently in the world there's only between probably 10 and 15 tier one ISPs in the world. So that large companies like NTT, AT&T and uh, a few other global ISPs. They have peering agreements with each other which means any tier one ISP who wants to send traffic to, through another tier one ISP, they can do it for free. They can send traffic in their direction, in the opposite direction is also free. But TOT, if it's a tier two ISP, would have to pay this tier one ISP for their traffic to transit. And similar, as we move up, we'd pay the higher level ISP for transit traffic. Of course, in some cases it makes sense to have a direct peering agreement between ISPs at the same level, even between levels. Instead of AS6 paying AS1 for their traffic to transit their network, to go to customers on network C, if AS6 creates a peering link to AS4, then the traffic can go direct to AS4 and down to AS9. That is, AS6 can bypass AS1 and go direct to AS4. It cuts down on the costs. Instead of paying AS1 to tr for their traffic to transit, they send it for free direct to AS4. That requires a direct link and some contract between the two or ISPs, but eventually can lead to a lower cost rather than paying someone else to use their network. So different ISPs may come to agreements to transit, to carry each other's traffic as opposed to paying someone else to carry their traffic for them. So we have tier one ISPs. They do not pay for transit. They have peering agreements with every other tier one ISP. There's about 15 in the world at the moment. Tier 2 ISPs are typically large ISPs, say national ISPs. They pay for transit from Tier 1 ISPs. Sometimes they'll peer with other ISPs. Tier 3 are the lowest level ISPs. And they pay Tier 2 or even in some cases Tier 1 ISPs to transit their traffic. You and I, and even companies like SIT, pay one of these ISPs to use their network. So our traffic goes via one of the ISPs and then up to eventually the destination. That's a quick and uh, in some case uh, approximate guide of how the internet is structured today. It's approximate because some of these definitions vary uh, in, in different literature. But it gives a, a, an approximate guide of the structure and relationship between internet service providers. The main points, each autonomous system or two autonomous systems that connect together are known as peers. They either have a private or a public peering connection. That's how they connect privately or publicly with each other. But they also have an agreement 
an agreement about whose traffic they will carry and how much you charge for that. And we can differentiate between transit agreements where one ISP pays another for them to carry their traffic, a smaller ISP pays a larger one, and peering agreements where two ISPs make an agreement and say let's carry each other's traffic for free, reducing their costs at the expense of creating some direct connection between them. <coughs> Internet exchange points similar to what, well, what, what we drew here, we have some common location where ISPs or autonomous systems connect into so that they can have public uh, peering between them. Some IXPs, internet exchange points, support hundreds of internet service providers. Last thing. We have been saying internet service providers. An autonomous system is not necessarily an internet service provider. In fact, nowadays, uh, well, many large companies have their own autonomous system but also content providers, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook, have their own autonomous system and can be seen as one of these entities in this network. Let's say a lot of the traffic goes to YouTube. YouTube is owned by Google, so it's part of Google's network. If Google's network is here, then all the traffic that goes to YouTube, this ISP needs to pay this one to get the traffic through their network. This one has to pay this one, and eventually it comes down to Google's network. Well, let's avoid these costs of paying the other ISPs to carry all this traffic to Google's network or for YouTube. One way is for this ISP to create a direct link, peer directly with Google, so that it goes direct to Google via a peering link rather than paying the higher level ISPs. And if you look at, do we have it? If you look at in your own time, where is it? Let's quickly look at it. The internet map of Thailand will see that. if I can log in. I'm just trying to connect to the internet. I'm talking about the internet, but I cannot connect to the internet. Let's try again.
map of the internet. This one's a bit old, but the latest one available. Here are some international internet gateways. So we see the autonomous system numbers, essentially different internet service providers, national level uh, ISPs. And this is showing the international connections. So these are internet service providers or organizations in other countries, in Korea, in Hong Kong, Singapore, and so on, and the links between them, and their autonomous system numbers. And we have some content, content providers also directly connected into Thailand. Microsoft, Google, and others you may recognize if you look through uh, here. I think Yahoo you'll see somewhere and so on. These content providers have created connections directly into uh, local or national ISPs such that the national ISPs no longer need to pay others for transit. And of course, we have a direct physical connection into Google. So it's faster for customers. So this is a benefit for the ISP that we don't, they don't have to pay another ISP for transit to reach Google. And it's a benefit for Google because the customers have faster access and are happier for using this content. So the autonomous systems are typically internet service providers, some content providers, and other large organizations. And that finishes our topic on the internet and the internet structure. Uh, slightly late, not enough time for a quiz, but in summary, the internet has some hierarchical structure today. It's made up of autonomous systems. Autonomous systems are connected via border, border routers. Between autonomous systems, they use the border gateway protocol to exchange information about their systems. Within an autonomous system, routing is performed using one of a several interior gateway protocols. End users, individuals as well as uh, companies, pay for transit via ISPs. We pay per month, for example, for our data to transit an internet, internet service provider. Some ISPs pay other ISPs to, for their data of all their customers to transit their network. Whereas, and in some cases, ISPs create agreements with each other to carry each other's traffic for free. That's a, a peering agreement to avoid having to pay others, reducing costs. Enough for today. We'll have a quiz tomorrow, and then we'll go on and look at how wireless LANs work.